Alright guys, chapter 3 is all about the cell structure and how it works. So, things we'll cover in this chapter are the plasma membrane, which is the outside of the cell, it holds everything in, the cytoplasm, that's the inside, the nucleus, which is kind of the brain of the cell, and all the little pieces within it. Um, if we have time, we'll touch on the growth and reproduction of cells as well. So to start things off, let's look at what a cell looks like. It's a pretty normal human cell. The nucleus is taking up a big part of it. That's this big purple guy. A little nucleolus in the middle. A whole bunch of this like bluish and greenish stuff, and right now it looks kind of like globs. We'll talk about what each one of those things is and why it's important to have in your cell. But to start things off, we're going to start with the plasma membrane, which is the outside piece here that's kind of cut away on this picture. So we blow it up. You can tell that there is a double layer. So there's phospholipids here. There's a layer right up top, and then there's a layer down below. The reason that we need to have phospholipid bilayer is so some things can get in and out and wiggle between, um, but really it kind of protects the cell and keeps it intact. There are different ways for things to get in and out of the cell. And one of those ways is by passive transport. And here's a good example of what that looks like. So these are potassium leakage channels, which are allowing potassium to leak in and leak out of the cell. Down here is the inside, and then up here we have the outside or extracellular fluid. Things like potassium can leak in and out without any problem at all. Bigger things like proteins, can't, throw, um, can't flow through those um, leakage channels because they're just too big and they don't fit. So how do we get other things that don't um, move back and forth so easily in and out? Well, we need to have some energy. And when we use energy, it's called active transport. This is one of the most important things you'll need to know about this chapter, how to get things in and out of the cell using energy. This example is the sodium-potassium pump. So let's see, first of all, if you remember what ATP stands for, adenosine triphosphate is going to be a very key role here, it's going to bind here later in the process. But just to start off, let's look at what we have here. The pump is open to the inside of the cell, which is allowing these little yellow dots, yellow dots are sodium, to move into these three spots. Once we have those all in, so we have one, two, three sodiums inside the pump. We're going to use that ATP, one of the phosphates will break off and bind at this site, which is going to cause the pump to open up. So it opens up to the outside. We release these three sodiums that were attached to the inside. And now we have two more spots for potassium to come in. So potassium, little green dots, are going to move on into the pump since it's still open and notice that the phosphate is still attached here. When the phosphate is released, because we can't hold on to it forever, the potassium will then move down into the open space which is on the inside of the cell. So those steps using ATP will move the sodium out and potassium in. Alright, so now that we've covered the membrane pretty well, let's look at the other things that are inside the cell. All these little guys that are inside the cell are called organelles. We have a mitochondria, ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, which is sometimes called the Golgi body, the lysosomes, peroxisomes, cytoskeleton, centrosome and centrioles, and cilia and flagella. I know those are kind of new words, so it helps to practice pronouncing them too. All right, let's start with the mitochondria. It's the power plant and it produces the cell's ATP. Here's what it looks like, kind of like a little bean almost with uh, channels inside. But its most important ro um, role is to produce energy for the cell's functions. Next up, the endoplasmic reticulum. There's two different kinds. There's a rough and a smooth. The rough is named that because it has these ribosomes on the outside that make it look kind of bumpy. Here, let's look at an example here. We have the rough has the little red dots. 
and the smooth, which is free of ribosomes, over here. The more, um, the thing to know about this is that it, um, sorry, it manufactures proteins, and it can help to catalyze reactions within the cell. All right, next up is the Golgi apparatus. It modifies, concentrates, and packages proteins. And a lot of times, the easiest way to think about this is that it's kind of the UPS system of the cell. So it's responsible for packaging things and shipping them out. That's kind of what it looks like. So if you were to um, receive something into the old um, Golgi apparatus, you're gonna package it up, concentrate it, and then ship it on out to where it needs to go. Lysosomes are good for digesting enzymes. And right here you can kind of tell they look like they're gobbling things up. And that's where the materials are being digested. Peroxisomes, very similar. They contain enzymes as well. But their most important job is to detoxify or get rid of harmful things. All right, so we need to kind of hold up our cell and it needs to have a system just like your body has a skeleton to hold you up the cell needs that too and we call it a cytoskeleton it's a bunch of rods that are running through the fluid to help keep it in um, in its structure three types the microfilaments the intermediate filaments and microtubules and I just really like these pictures because they're kind of cool um, these are actual pictures of a microscopic uh, microscopic view of how these things are put together. So you can see it's kind of like a spider web in the way that they hold up and pr uh, provide kind of a scaffolding for the, for the cells themselves. Next two organelles, the centrosomes and centrioles, are important for the cell division. And you'll see why. Let's just take a look at what they look like. Little groups of rods like this. And as the cell starts to divide, these two things, these centrioles, are going to split apart from each other and provide a kind of a polar attraction within the cell before it splits. Three different types of cellular extensions. Uh, sometimes there's cilia, sometimes there's a flagella, and a microvilli. Um, microvilli. Each one of those has a different use, and we'll get into that more in class. Lastly, the nucleus. Very, very important. It's the control center. Like I said before, it's kind of the brain of the cell. It contains all the DNA. So if you didn't have a nucleus, you would not be able to um, transfer DNA material from one cell to the next, telling it what it needs to become. The um, in the human body, most cells only have one nucleus. The red blood cells are the only cells in your body without any nuclei. And the nucleus is always larger than the other organelles that we just covered. So if you're ever in doubt of wh which one's which, the nucleus is the biggest. And here's an example of what that looks like when it's blown up. Huge nucleus and then a little nucleolus in the middle. Okay, we are going to skip ahead a little bit and cover the cell growth and reproduction. The cell life has two phases, interphase and cell division. So no matter what, the cell at any point is going to be either in interphase or dividing. This is what a cell life kind of looks like. So in this part back here, the green part, this is when the cell is in normal, just one cell, hanging out, doing its thing, and then we get to this yellow part where we have a, the mitotic phase where it begins to split into two completely individual cells. Here are nice pictures of how that works. So interphase, one nice cell, remember those centrioles right here, they're just hanging out. They become very important when we start the mitotic phase, which would be prophase they start to split apart. And you can see they're kind of pulling towards one end and the other. By the end of prophase, you'll see there's a split, uh, spindle pole here and here. And they're starting to pull all of the nucleus apart. 
The next step is metaphase, which you can see here. All of the little chromosomes are going to line up in the middle. And I remember that because middle starts with M, metaphase starts with M. So you'll see that kind of along the equator here. During anaphase, each of the chromosomes is pulled apart into a daughter chromosome. So now you can see it's only half. Half is going to this side, half is going to this side. The last phase is tele, um, telophase, where we start to split that cell in half again. So now we're eventually going to end up with one cell here, one cell here, and they should be exact copies of what we started with originally. We'll go over get this again in class, but make sure you understand these steps a lot on your own so you won't fall behind as we move through this when we meet in person.